he let our bill sit on his desk the first time for six months. And I think, by the way, I think maybe like two or three breweries closed in that six months, which was, which, you know, pissed everybody away. And they ended up doing it. And as much as, you know, we had always criticized the governor for, you know, allowing those restrictions to go in place at the beginning anyway, right? Like he could have, with a stroke of a pen, just made this all go away. Like he could have. We still say that. The famous quote that he had had, and it was on a local TV show, was that somebody asked him, like, why can't you make these re- these restrictions go away? He says, I can't. You're the governor. You can do whatever you want. I mean, he's the strongest governor in the state. I mean, the entire country. But he claimed he couldn't do it. So, but at the end of the day, he ultimately signed the bill. Got to give him credit um, for doing that. Um, you know, he recognized the need to, to do this, but... You know, it was a situation, honestly, that probably should have never happened to begin with. All right, welcome back to the Brewdat Podcast. I'm your host, Richie Tevlin, joined by Evan Blum. And this week we have Eric Orlando, the uh, Government Affairs Director yeah. of yeah. the Brewers Guild of New Jersey and a professional lobbyist. So I have, you know, obviously this conversation is going to be all about New Jersey craft beer yeah. and what's going on because it always seems like something's going on over there. And recently, you know, there's been a lot of openings as far as like what breweries are allowed to do. And, you know, being in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, we're not always accustomed to like what exactly is happening over there. So we're hoping you can shed some light on that. But okay. first off, I want to hear kind of who you are and also what, I guess, is a lobbyist? Like, what, what does a lobbyist do? And sure. why are we interviewing a lobbyist here to craft beer podcast? Sure. So it's kind of interesting, right? So I had the title starting 18 for the Brewers Guild when I first started as executive director. Um, but my, I don't know if you want to call it a day job or not. I'm a contract lobbyist. Yeah. People hire me to lobby the New Jersey legislature and state government, right? So I have my firm that I work at, the Zeta Group, which is in West Trent. It's Ewing Township. Um, has like 70 clients all over the board. So we represent companies, nonprofits, associations, all different sort of thing. One of my clients is the Brewers Guild in New Jersey. You know, so I've been working in the lobbying field on the industry's behalf, going back to the old Garden State Brewers Guild, right? So we're talking about when there was one association at the time. Um, 18, some things went down. A couple of folks didn't like the way things were going in terms of the State Trade Association. They started their own thing. I was close to those folks, right? So they're like, okay, so we're going to start our thing because we still want to be at the table in terms of everything that's going down with craft beer. So we started the Brewers Guild in New Jersey, and I became their first executive director. And that, and it was the Garden State Brewers Association before that? Garden State Craft Brewers Guild okay, was the original one. Okay, that's different than the New Jersey Brewers Association as well. So, it's, it's a, it's, so this is the story, right? So... Garden State Craft Brewers Guild starts way back then. We're talking like the 90s. Okay. We're talking... Maybe a dozen breweries. And was it specifically craft beer or all craft beer? Okay. Just all craft beer. So okay. we're talking like Flying Fish. Yeah. We're talking Climax and like North Jersey. We're talking about the guys that started like in ninety four, ninety five. Like the really full The guys that aren't here anymore, but that allowed everybody else to Oh, be everybody here. everybody's okay. on their, you know, kind of like they were the stepping stone to all this, right? Yeah. So it was those guys who started everything up. They started their own kind of association. At that point, it was more of kind of like a drinking club. I mean, it was like a couple of people getting around a table, comparing like what they were working on, talking about big ideas, but nothing really happening. Um, but that then ended up morphing into like a real kind of like trade association, right? That they started actually having like more reform meetings and memberships and like bylaws and all that kind of stuff. And that's kind of where I kind of got into it. There was a time when there was one association it ended up becoming the New Jersey Brewers Association. There was a split. Um, some folks didn't like the direction of the association, the way the industry was going. So they started the Brewers Guild in New Jersey. And that's when I became the executive director. Um, but, you know, my experience goes back to 2009 with the industry and working on some of the first kind of like reforms to the way the laws were in New Jersey about what you could and couldn't do as a brewery. You know, prior to 2012, you could like have a couple samples and buy two six packs. That was it. Right, which was much different than like most of the states in the country, particularly in Pennsylvania, where why were, why were they so different? I mean, it, this is what it all comes down to, right? And I don't know what a liquor license here costs in New, in Pennsylvania or in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. 
New Jersey, it's a million dollars, right? So if you're opening up a business that wants to sell alcohol, you know, that was the going rate to basically get the privilege to sell alcohol. So they saw these brewers come in and be like, you, oh, it was, is, you it guys was, are just skipping the front of the line? We were tearing down the entire system, yeah. right? Like they put all this investment, and I get it. Like there's folks, and I recognize, they put all this investment in. They had family-owned businesses, you know, second, third, fourth generation, that they saw these new folks coming in that were selling alcohol to people to drink on, don't want to drink on premise, and that was a huge threat to their bottom line mm-hmm. and the value of the liquor license. It makes sense. Every single thing that happens in New Jersey state alcohol policy is dictated by that license value, whether it be bars and restaurants or liquor stores, because liquor stores also have a license, and those licenses also go for a million dollars plus in some communities, and they didn't want somebody to be able to sell you, you know, a case of beer and not having to foot the same bill that they did. Now, I'll tell you, a lot of restaurants and liquor stores in New Jersey did not pay a million dollars for the liquor license. Their grandfather's grandfather probably paid like a thousand dollars for that liquor <laughs> license, and it's more than paid off for himself. But the fact is, is that you know, yeah, but were, still, that's part of it. Yeah. Oh, sure. And that's what it is. That's why there's been so much regulation on this industry. That's why there was so much pushback. That's why, honestly, the regulators that were so used to the old-fashioned system wanted to maintain it because the folks that were typically at the table making those decisions were those bars and restaurants and liquor stores that wrote the laws in the first place, coming out of prohibition even. So, you know, trying to trying to allow somebody to pour you a beer and drink it there without a liquor license, a system that had been around for like 80 or 90 years, that's what we were up against, and that's why we, were, we had to do what we had to do. Yeah, I mean, it, that, that's, that's, that's what we're still dealing with today, and that's what, you know, we're going to continue to deal with. It's, it's not going to change. Did you think this challenge would take you as long, not even as long, but like so, into years? You've been doing this for what, over yeah. 15 years? I mean, nothing nothing surprises me in any of this. Even the simplest piece of the legislation that I work on for some of the clients become like some of the most challenging because there are people that come in from like left field with concerns that are just like impossible to deal with. I think this one though, and you know, while... It took us almost three years to get this latest revision done that just happened. You know, there was progress made during the entire time. I mean, we were building support. I mean, I, I, it was funny. When, and by the way, as much as the restrictions in New Jersey that most people kind of woke up to, people think were already around for two years, this goes back to something that happened like back in 2017. So it's really like a seven-year thing. It's not even like a two-year thing. It only became a real public legislative thing in the last two years. And that's when we really had to like get the word out to like fans and everybody to like call your legislator and like tell them to like get rid of those restrictions. And it just like took off like a rocket. Like I never thought I'd be, you know, working on an issue where like members of Congress together, like Republicans and Democrats, which do not get along, would sign the same piece of paper saying get rid of these state restrictions. You like I woke up beer. <laughs> well, that's and that's the thing. It's like it's one of those things that they look and they they see their voters and they see the constituents and it's like they're all supporting this. Why wouldn't you support it? I mean, I had there was a legislator um, during this entire process that said that in a week's time they got thirteen hundred emails in support of us. <laughs> Like, that never happens, right? Like, having that level of support should make it, like, super easy, despite, like, all the pushback, all the money that folks who traditionally don't support us put towards trying to, like, keep us from doing this. But, you know... It's important. It shows that it's an important issue. Like, people think that, like, beer is not that important, but, like, the fact that matters, you know, people are passionate about it, and, like, it's a huge... Well, that's the thing, too. I can remember, you know, when I first started working with the industry back when, when you had, like, less than two dozen breweries... You couldn't go into an elected official's office, even to like a mayor or something, and saying, you should do this because there's a business in your town that needs your help, right? When you have 140, 150 breweries now in the state, you can go into a legislator's office and say, by the way, your legislative district has a dozen breweries in it. Yeah, and they probably know somebody that works there or, you know, they go a there. fan of there. They, they go, go there. there. They go there. And that's another thing is, too, is that um, this legislator, legislature now in particular, they're more our age, Right. They've gone to breweries before. They, it's part of their life. They get the experience. This isn't like their parents or their grandparents. This is part of so they're like, so why shouldn't I be able to have food at a brewery? 
why should I have to take a stupid tour every single time I go? Like things like that, they look and they go, no, these are like part of the communities now. Why wouldn't I want to support them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's why that's so unanimous between everybody is like breweries are such a community driven part of every town now, it seems like. Yeah. So to to stunt that from just the whole community. It was also, it was just like common sense stuff. Like the whole taking the tour of the brewery to get Mm -hmm. them samples. It's like everybody was like clearly not faking it, but it was like clearly a setup just to do go through the wall. So it's like people were literally as a society, we're just like going through this extra motion of something that everyone's going to do anyway for, for what purpose does that serve? And that's the thing. I mean, that came about and I was, on the first time when we changed the law to allow everybody to have pour a pint of beer at a brewery, yeah. it was one of those concessions we had to make at the time to get like that bigger issue course, across the yeah. finish line, right? So we kind of knew that it was one of those things like, like people are going to have to comply with, but it was a matter of just like the state actually enforcing it. So I can't tell you how many conversations we have with regulators to say what the hell actually a tour is. I mean, we had people, we had people, and what we had people like on do murals on the wall to say like this is how beer is made the folks down in Cape May put a lot of money into it I remember you had to like walk through a part of the brewery and there was like a whole like museum museum exhibit that it was basically like a pathway museum to get into it like they took like full advantage of it and they did all this different <laughs> kind of stuff which now now there's not a tour requirement anymore so I don't know what they're doing with that but um but like everybody did it in their own way um also too I mean think about it there was a tour requirement on the books during COVID you couldn't go into a brewery to do a brewery tour. So, like, we had to have conversations like, okay, are we still going to have to take a tour of a brewery? Are we going to have to, like, give somebody, like, a piece of paper that explains how beer yeah, is made? Yeah, you have to build an external outdoor you museum. You know, all those, and this is it, all those kind of conversations, when we were trying to finally get rid of this thing, it made it really easy, easy because it, it's like, how stupid does this sound? Yeah. So, like it didn't matter what party you were from and things like that. People kind of got it and be like, okay, this is an impediment to a small business succeeding. And customers are had enough with, I mean, one of the things on that tour requirement was, and this was one of the solutions the state had put, which was ridiculous. Every single time you go, you have to have like a book at the front door. And you're supposed to sign the book to say, I'm here. And then the brewery's supposed to look at it and compare it to the last time you're here and saying, oh, you were already here and took the tour. You don't have to take it again. I mean, there were people thinking about actually hiring people just to enforce that. Oh, my gosh. And it's, it was just like that for a small business. Like, think about it. Like, a husband and wife opens a brewery. Who's going to be responsible for the book at the front door? It, it, was, it was stupid. And it was, it was one of those things that, um, honestly, when we were trying to change the law, we always raised things like that because it became to, like, folks that weren't used to this experience and weren't used to these laws being like, you mean you have to give a tour every single time? And it was like, yeah, we're going to get rid of that. No problem. And that was that was one of those things, as hard as it was at the beginning to get rid of, at by the end, people were like, it's a foregone conclusion. It's gone. Don't even worry about it. And it was, you know, we slowly whittled them away um, and got at them um, that it almost was like, yeah, we're going to get rid of all that. Don't worry about it. And that's what ended up happening. Can you like just talk about some of the laws and restrictions that breweries had to go through? I, I know... Death of the Fox always did a really good job mm-hmm. of getting things in front of eyes. Uh, that's how I saw a lot of the yeah. stuff uh, from my perspective. Um, well, but Chuck like, sued the state, too, so that was another thing. Yeah, <laughs> that, is, that is also why I saw that. Yeah, yeah, Chuck, he sued the state. But, I mean, but that was a thing, right? There was the tour requirement was a big deal. And that was more of a nuisance more than anything, right? Mm-hmm. The problem was, was that if you violated it, the state can come in and, like, give you a $1,000 fine. Right. The second time they can shut your business down for two weeks. You know, third time it's probably more than that, and then probably you don't have a business in a month because you can't open. So I mean there was like serious repercussions yeah. to doing that sort of thing. The other big thing was and it's still a little bit not fully to where we ultimately wanted to get it, but it's at a good place. We couldn't work with a food vendor. First of all, there was a prohibition. You couldn't cook food on premise, right? So there was no kitchens at these breweries. Which is so backwards because everything that you mm-hmm. hear about alcohol safety and mm-hmm. you know safe bar practices is you need to drink slowly and eat while you're drinking. And then this is the state saying you are not allowed to do that. Well, this is hilarious, right? So they put out a document that tells you what you can and can't do. And one of the first things is in the document that says you need tip certification 
for every bartender and tip in certification the is you need to have snacks behind the bar. And, and then you look at a place like Pennsylvania where literally it requires you to have food. Mm-hmm. It's like, all right, what are we doing here? It, it kind of, it, it was really transparent at that point about who was kind of writing these rules. It was the folks that wanted to protect their self-interest, and it was the bars and the restaurants at the time that were like, we don't want them to do close to anything that we're doing, so we need to put things in place that say, you can't have these food options on premise. You know, we had to maintain to get this latest revision done that you couldn't operate a restaurant on a premise, but now for the first time, we can actually have a food truck. You know, we can actually sell like snacks, like bags of chips and stuff like that. When you're having a party at a brewery or something like that, we can give you a list of like restaurants and vendors that you can call to bring food in. We can work with that vendor to bring the food in and actually set it up. Mm-hmm. Like common sense things that, you know, are going to mean like a lot of new revenue to some of the breweries that hopefully they can kind of get back up on their feet. I mean, think about it. You have all these restrictions in place. You had COVID. Um, you had all this lack of revenue coming in. Now it's like all these things are opened up again. I mean, there should be there should be a lot of customers coming in. There should be a lot of events happening. There should be all these different things happening that hopefully these folks can like grow their business and then some folks even like expand or maybe get like another location in the state to do. Yeah, it. and it was be it was beyond just it was hard for people in New Jersey to go. I mean, you I know you're part uh, board on the tourism board in New Jersey. Yep. And we talk about tourism here where like breweries are a huge part of tourism because they're a destination, mm-hmm. you know, business. Like people travel from far and wide to go visit and like try different breweries and you know as somebody from Pennsylvania you know, I would go over to New Jersey sometimes to go to the breweries, mm-hmm. but even though it wasn't a big deal to like do the tour, it's just, it was always in the back of my mind, like, oh, there's these new restrictions. I like, what's the point of going anyway? So then like, yeah. even though you can, like it got to the point where you could go and you could enjoy a brewery, it was like still in the back of my mind that like, I just wasn't going. And that's the thing. One of the, there was a kind of a fine line that we were trying to walk, even in terms of changing this last law, it was like, okay how much negatively do we actually want to talk about our own industry? Like how much like are we going to put in the face of customers every single time they walk in a tasting room, like about how much the laws suck and about how we need your help to change them. Like people just want to go and have a beer. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was like, there was that kind of thing that I actually had some breweries at one point saying, maybe we shouldn't be talking to the press as much about this all the time because people aren't going to want to come in because they're going to think it's our a, brewery it's suck. It's a fine line. People go to drink yeah. to forget about their problems. I'm like, what, now they have to go to a bar and, like, solve another issue? Yeah, it's like, yeah. And I was like, we just don't want this to always to be about, like, a civics class, like yeah. how a bill becomes a law. But, you know, we had some really great, you know, customers that wanted to help out. So every single time we called upon them, whether it had been, like, in one of our beer collabs or, you know, in some type of, like, mailing or something, there was, like, call your legislator or something like that, they did. I mean, we had, like I was saying, we had 1,300 legislators in one week call a very important legislator to tell them to support a bill. We had 30,000 fans at one point contact the governor's office. I mean, the Brewers Association, who we worked with on some of the outreach that we were doing to fans to try to get this bill over the finish line, said that they had never seen such a reaction in terms of getting emails to district offices and legislators before. Like, they were going to use this as, like, an example for, like, other, like, states around the country. Like, if you're going to do this, do it in the same way because it, it like, it, it proved results. And I give the BA a ton of credit because they gave us the resources that otherwise we wouldn't have had to get our message out to everybody. And, and it really, it worked. It worked. So you, you as a legislator, like we, we can talk about the laws, but like you're talking to these people that are making these rules every day and like you're kind of setting these programs up yep. or like setting the email programs up, I guess, where they can like automatically email the, the legislators. What sort of, were there like hurdles that stood out over the process where there was like spe- maybe specific people or getting the governor on board or like st- yeah. certain things that were like these needed to happen and like these were like kind of checkpoints that you hit to get this passed yeah so i mean as much as you know there's a, a lot of people know what a brewery is now yeah there were still a lot of people we had to do a lot of education with right so you know there were some older legislators that didn't know i mean they were here literally from their grandkids that go to breweries like what a brewery is but like people were really unfamiliar with the problem was with the law so at first we we had to do a ton of education right they're just not going to support us just because we asked them to yeah. we got to prove it so we had to do a lot of that um 
you know, and then there's, you know, we're dealing with a system that was 80 years in the making, if not, you know, longer, that a lot of these legislators had been steered in the direction of traditional alcohol interests, whether they be the bars and restaurants with the liquor licenses or the wholesalers or things like that about what their stance on one of these issues. So we had to work really hard to kind of undo that because they had painted a picture over time about how breweries were going to destroy family businesses and breweries were going to upset the system. It was going to hurt tax revenue, all these different types of things. So when you're up against all that, you first have to deal with all of those issues before you even pitch what the solution that you're working on is. So um, part, in part, that was part of the problem. Plus two, I mean, every state, every legislature, every state house has a ton of issues happening at the same time. The 120 legislators in New Jersey get pulled in a million different directions on a daily basis. Um, it's trying to get in front of them to actually notice you. That's for the one thing, and to actually make some of these issues resonate. Um, you know, we did, I think, a pretty good job of getting the word out in like local media. Um, I'll tell you, and it's interesting having done this now for a couple of years. Philadelphia media market cares about our issues way, way more than the New York media market. And there are a ton of North Jersey breweries, but, you know, the Channel 6, you know, the folks, in, you know, it, all the, the radio stations, everything like that, the, the, the print media, they were reaching out all the time asking, what's the update? How do we get that all the time that we really took advantage of that? And they made the super like hyper local, the story super hyper local. I mean, you're saying Chuck at, at Death of the Fox. I think for a couple of months he had a TV crew at his brewery like every week. I mean, they at every single different thing that the state issued, like a piece of paper or something that he did legally, they showed up to have another thing and it gave us another bite at the apple to try to get the story out. And we packaged all that stuff out, sent it all to legislators saying, You see, we're still getting screwed. You need your help. And it, it really helped it. But, you know, the you know, the Philadelphia media market really honed in on this. Um, and you know, it, it was one thing that we definitely took advantage of. That's really interesting. Why do you yeah. think New York was a little out of the... I don't know. I mean, it's funny. I grew up in central New Jersey, um, North Jersey to some people, um, but they just don't come out to New Jersey too often. It's it's like a super... It's a super city, <laughs> city-centric thing where it's like they go to Long Island, but they stay in the city. They don't do more with North Jersey. Where I find it, particularly in Philadelphia, they're in South Jersey all the time, right? And they get out there. I mean, they live there in the summer. Uh, and that too, right? Like in, and I notice at the state house, the press row is not what it used to be. There's only so many reporters that cover it. Newspapers are definitely not what they used to be. There's not a lot of people paying attention to what's actually going on in Trenton. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia still has reporters at the state house. Like they're paying attention every day to what's going on. So when they see this story that might have like some popular appeal, they jump on it and they're like, they give you an ability to get your message out. And that was a thing. We always did that. If I thought that something was relevant to the day, you know, I had people that I was able to contact and say, there's a bill up for vote tomorrow. You guys should have somebody there. And they showed up. I mean, New York didn't do that. Philly did. Um, so, you know. So was this, was the push for this, did you find, you know, Jersey, it's kind of like Pennsylvania. I mean, not not as bad as Pennsylvania, where there's like Pittsburgh and Philly, but like there's definitely different sections in Jersey. Were there different? Did like South Jersey kind of help push this through more so than North Jersey, or you're just saying that like the, kind of the media? So I think, and that's the thing. There are certain towns in South Jersey um, that I think fully embrace breweries coming to them, and it was for all different types of reasons. Some folks just didn't have; they had a lot of space open. Yeah. That was workable. Like, you know, a lot of these main streets. I mean, I it's funny. My my wife grew up in Pittman, right? Yeah. Pittman, who didn't allow alcohol until like five years ago, right? So Pittman was the test. Their test case with alcohol was having two breweries in before they even allowed a restaurant to open and sell alcohol, <laughs> which was, it was amazing to me when she, was tell, when she was telling me this about how it was like they were one of like the 30 dry towns in the state that was left, but a brewery was allowed to open. Then you have a place like, you know, like Collingswood and all these places. They had a brewery before they had al they have the alcohol, right? Yep, uh, Devil's Creek and I, Sweet Sparrow just moved in there. Yeah, exactly. It's like, so, but there was folks that were looking to have businesses open to draw people to their downtowns. Um, so those folks got used to, like, honestly, like a, beer, a Main Street beer culture. 
And those breweries made a connection with their fans. They turned their fans on to this. I think between the local politicians, the local mayors, the local legislators, and the media, all of that came together, and they were all moving in one direction. Um, also, too, it's, it's interesting. Liquor licenses seem to cost a lot more in North Jersey. Um, there's more people, so there's more liquor licenses, but it just seems that the value of the licenses kind of drive the discussion to a certain extent, whereas in South Jersey... It's like the New York City tax. People there. don't care. Yeah. People just don't. People just don't care. Yeah. They're just more open to it. Plus, I think what happens on this side of the river um, and how the brewery culture has kind of popped up here, people are like, "Why can't we have that on in South Jersey? Like, we're we're used to these businesses opening. We would like to have that here, and that's what people wanted, and they and they did it." Yeah, uh, interesting I mean, South enough. South Jersey is like the sixth county of Jersey, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Philadelphia. I mean, it's like if you can go, and this it's always the funny thing, and people used to always say this. If I'm going to like a brewery on a Saturday in a Philadelphia and I can do all these cool things and I don't have any of these restrictions. And then the next weekend I go back on the other side of the river and I hit my, my local place and there's all these things that say you can't do it. That gets people engaged in being like, so I live here, but I have to go to another state to enjoy the brewery how I want to do it. That's not, that's not fair. Yeah. I, I know uh, Van Lu is out in Percocy. They, they're New Jersey based people. Like Van Lu was a street in Jersey. But they specifically opened in PA just to avoid all these laws that uh, yeah. could hinder them. So, I yeah. mean, that's just one story. I'm sure there's many others, and there too. Was, there was many times when, before the restrictions were lifted, that I heard of plenty of folks, particularly in South Jersey, saying, yeah, maybe I just go across the border. I mean, literally. Like, And there were some folks that even when, I mean, we've had some closures. Like, There's no doubt that folks weren't able to ride it out that were saying, like, you know what, I'm not. I'm not sticking around. I'm going um, because there's a state there that seems to understand how we work and wants to embrace us. Um, and by the way, too, and Pennsylvania that, has tight liquor laws, but the production alcohol laws oh, in Pennsylvania totally are different. unbelievable. Totally They're different. And, and by the way, too, I mean, we kind of the grass is always greener on the other side. Right. I get it. Like, I'm sure there's things in Pennsylvania that breweries and retailers and stuff hate too. I mean, state stores is, is kind of a weird concept to us, New Jersey. I mean, I'm used to it because I, um, I live close enough to Pennsylvania that I see it. But, you know, it, the way that folks looked at some of the other states, I mean, Pennsylvania was what, second or third in the country in the amount of breweries in it. I mean, even in New York, I mean, I think it was either second or third too. New Jersey was like middle of the pack, if not towards the end in terms of it. And when you have like per capita numbers that show that like New Jersey's like in the lower 10 states per capita, the amount of breweries, mm -hmm. there obviously was a lot of room for growth because there's a population there to drink it. Mm -hmm. The fact was the laws were stopping us from doing it. Um, hopefully now with these, with these changes, we improve those numbers and folks say like, okay, there's an opportunity here for actually me to start a business the way I want to. And then I can actually succeed as opposed to saying like, you know what, I'm going to New York, I'm going to Pennsylvania, I'm going to open there. I don't have to worry about this crap. I could just do it. And that's it. Yeah. Sick of your POS system being a POS? POS specialists powered by Heartland have been the experts in cutting-edge POS technology for over 20 years. But they're not script writers, so they let AI write their script. Thirsty for a delicious deal? Feast your eyes on our tastefully crafted point-of-sale system. From order up to cash out, this POS is the coriander spice your brewery needs. It'll have you saying, brost. Yikes. See? That's why they have a 24-7 live phone support, not chatbots. Their experienced project managers will program your POS, train your staff, so you can just focus on the beer and not worry about the AI. Ask about their free processing options, handhelds, and online ordering. Email kevin at posspecialists.com. Mention Brewdad and get $500 off your install. Email kevin at posspecialists.com. Maybe I'm just lived in Philly long enough that I'm like starting to recognize these Jersey breweries, but when we talked about it before we came on here, like Tonewood is the hottest brewery yep. in the area and they're a Jersey brewery. Yep. Um, I think that there's more names that are popping up. They're just coming, coming like household names of breweries in, in New Jersey. And it's, and there's some folks too. It's funny. They're, you know, magnify up in Essex County, yeah. up in Fairfield. They're opening up their, their second brewery in the state of New Jersey, right? I think there's going to be folks, I think the trend's going to be, particularly with some of these restrictions being lifted, 
You know, we still can't, and this is one of the interesting things, the beer you make on premise is the only beer you could sell. Right, so if you're so you gonna, can't contract brew and then bring it in, and no. you can't like bring in other like in Pennsylvania, you could sell Yingling out of your no. place because it's made in Pennsylvania. And I can go, and I mean, I've done it. I've gone to places like uh, Bitch and Kitten in like Morrisville and some of the other breweries where they have other stuff on tap. They have other like local alcohol, like like spirits mm-hmm. and wine and stuff like that. Like the folks in Vault, I live close enough to Yardley and stuff like that that yeah. I can you know it's yeah. easy to get to places like that. So I see that, and it's like you know that's something down the road like New Jersey would love to do. But like right now, we can only sell on premise the stuff that we make. So the guys at Magnify that are opening up this brand new brewery down in South Jersey can't take the stuff from North Jersey and bring it down to their place. That's a bitch call right? it like that. So it's like yeah. you literally you have, have to, to build yeah. an entirely new brewery. And even if you have some kind of like flagship beer that is in like every liquor store on tap in New Jersey, you have to make it there. Yeah, to be able you, to sell you essentially it. have to be a brew pub. Even if you're starting small, you have to have something there. So there's, there's, there's those type of nuances to like New Jersey law that I think folks are still looking at because it's like, okay, we got rid of all this stuff about the experience that we wanted to offer customers on premise. We also got our ability to do like events off premise and do so stuff. So the ma- major points were the events, drinking on premise and like... Some of the food stuff, the food coordination okay, yep. stuff, the now we don't have a cap on the amount of on premise events. So you events. can make food now? We can work with a food truck, okay. bring a food truck in, and have the food truck sell our customers' beer, uh, food. So I mean, that's... Baby steps. <laughs> so it's enough. Like, we can't have a kitchen. So think okay. about it this way. Anything that doesn't involve cooking it, we can do. Okay. You can have a kitchen if you have the liquor license already, though, for the breweries, so, yeah. right? So yeah. yeah. So And that's the thing, too. There's two different categories of what you would consider brewery license to stay in New Jersey. So like Iron Hill, um, who operates what we would call a brew pub mm-hmm. in New Jersey... Um, has a different license than Tonewood has. So Tonewood still has those restrictions on it that they can't have the kitchen. And what do you mean by kitchen? Like, is that, or is there gray area there? Like, can you make hoagies? Like, is that considered no, cooking? No, there's no food preparation. Okay. There's no All food. Right. And by the way, okay. too, we're still talking about that kind of stuff with folks in New Jersey about, like, what the line is in yeah. terms of it. Um, because we're in this new world now that there's all these guys that have, like, ideas about, okay, so... If I have something like under a warming lamp, or I have something in a refrigerator, yeah, essentially you're just bringing catered food every day and just sell that. Like, like, it, like, there's all those things we're still doing, but that's the so, like an Iron Hill, let's say, they have a different type of license where they're allowed to have a kitchen, they're allowed to have a full bar, all different types of alcohol because they have to have a liquor license to be able to operate. They're, they've already paid the million dollars. They paid the million dollars. They paid the full freight. They can have the kitchen. They can make their own beer. Um, but they can also have all different types of alcohol. That's different than a brewery license that in New Jersey has, that it's only your own alcohol you could sell. And by the way, you can't have a kitchen. That's still the rules, Mm -hmm. the way it is. There are still 150 businesses in the state that are operating that way. Right. What what's the rules as far as number of locations? Because in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, I think you can have like three or four and they're they're like storage locations, but you can like you're capped at that for each then production facility that you have. Um, and then are there, are there restrictions for – I think there's restrictions for brew pubs also, or there used to be? So we, this is it. So back in 2012 when we did the previous revision, there was a cap on the amount of brew pubs you could own. And it was basically similar to the, how many liquor licenses that you could own. Now, like in Iron Hill, they can op- open up 10 brew pubs if they wanted to. Okay. Right? Okay. There's no cap on the amount of breweries that you can own in the state of New Jersey. And I think you're starting to see a trend. And I think, you know, the folks down here, like Swedesboro, Mm -hmm. they're opening up like their satellite location, the old um, Devil's Creek. Um, You know, the folks, like I said, in Magnify up in North Jersey, they're opening up their satellite location down in South Jersey. Um, Bonesaw, they got the place in Deptford. They're also talking about opening up a place in Freehold in Monmouth County, right? So... The idea now that you can have a certain amount of food collaboration to bring food in that somebody else is cooking, you don't have those event restrictions that say you can only have like you can only show a baseball game fifty two times a year, or you can only have amplified music fifty two yeah, times was, a year. Well, it was like something about like acoustic mu- music versus mm-hmm. like electric music. I was like, what? No, I mean and that's the thing too. It, it's laughable to think about how long that place that stuff was in place but it was in place like no lie seven years um and how an agency that's supposed to regulate alcohol 
was given the authority to literally dictate the difference between somebody strumming an acoustic guitar versus plugging into an amp. And like I was saying before. And I'm just like, yeah. like where does the buck end there? Like who, oh, who it, is what, the one that's unless like, we Unless we said something, it wasn't. It was going to keep going. Convening, the, like they're, they're now in charge of alcohol, but, and they are also now a musical expert. Like, Well, and that's the thing. We had, so what we were always told, and I think it's still, it's still to a certain extent, we operate under a license. So the entire facility is licensed. Anything that go that went on inside the licensed facility, they could tell us what to do. They didn't have to do with the alcohol. It was everything that was literally in the building. So I mean, and they with other with other different types of businesses that operate under you know alcohol laws, they've done s- not to the extent that impacted this industry, but they've gone places there that have, you know people have reacted to the same way negatively. But this was such an overshoot. Um, that, you know, that's why there was such a huge reaction to, I mean, they almost gave us material to work with to a certain extent. Now, you know, nobody should have gone through it for as long as they went through because I mean, business is closed because of what they did. Um, you know, some people that put like life savings that had mortgages on the line. I mean, and like, even if they didn't close, stuff. you know, like there's basically like th- three, four years of revenue that they don't have now. Yeah. And, like they're still working up to then make the next expansion. I mean, people, I mean, couple that with COVID, people lost their jobs. Yeah. I mean, right? Like people had jobs on the line. There, There is, you know, you think about it, like, you know, what, how much, how many businesses go into a can of beer or a glass of beer, right? It's like, it's the folks that sell you the grain. It's the hops. It's the materials. It's the labels. It's you know. It's every different component of that business. They're selling you something, and there's a business attached to that. The less beer you sell, the less people make downstream. And it's manufacturing jobs that are like stable jobs that yeah. everyone talks about all over the country. All like over. we need more of this to make like the economy better, to make everything more stable. It's like these are the jobs that are good jobs I that always, you want people in your community to have. I always think, and this is it, we're kind of like the perfect storm in terms of an industry, right? So it's small business. Everybody loves small business. Everybody wants to tell small business. It's manufacturing, mm-hmm. right? There's not too many industries that are coming up these days that are manufacturing. We're tourism, right? We serve a lot of purposes. A lot of states, including New Jersey to a certain extent, are trying to promote the idea that, you know, there is this industry out there along with everybody else in craft beverage and wine and things like that that you should go see other than just going to the Jersey Shore. Because New Jersey, it's like every single dollar of promotion goes to the Jersey Shore. We're trying to get our fair share of that too. I mean, agriculture, right? Folks are increasingly losing local products in their beers. Um, you know, there's Rabbit Hill down in South Jersey that's supplying a lot of the breweries all over the state, and people take pride in doing that. I mean, even some of the beers, like, you know, the beer that we're doing for the New Jersey campaign now is using Rabbit Hill malt in some cases, right? So it's like there's an agricultural component too. So you have all of those things that people really care about wrapped into one industry. Mm -hmm. To me, it's like it's the easiest thing to embrace because it's got something for everybody. So if you're, I don't know, a, a local politician, that's trying to show you're trying to help out local businesses and appeal to voters. This is the industry to work with, right? This is it. This is an easy lift. Um, they're really cool people. Um, people like them. It's it 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 makes all the sense in the world to be involved in this industry. Uh, when did you get involved? Uh, we obviously we talked about this yeah. beforehand, but a little bit about just how you so, made your journey. So I have been working in the lobbying industry. So I first got my first job in the lobbying industry in 2002, right? So it took a little bit of time, you know, for me to actually, you know, start working with this industry. But I was a, I was a craft beer fan. Like I started drinking it, started learning more about it. But I'm thinking like, okay, so how do I work with this industry in some capacity? Because I know there's going to be some challenges to it. You know, read up a little about it, like some things that were going on out west in terms of different laws and things that were getting done. And I contacted the Brewers Association, and I talked to Paul Gatza, and I talked to Paul, and I said, Paul, I said, if there's ever an opportunity to work with your industry, I'd love to do it. So what he ended up doing was he goes, well, you know, there's this brewery owner down in South Jersey that um, is, you know, kind of running the local guild in the state, 
which I didn't even know they're, you know, I was used to associations and things like that. I knew what a guilt was. Um, you should talk to him. Here's his email address. Um, it was Gene Muller at Flying Fish. Um, so I reached out to Gene and I said, you know, I would love to opportunity to work with you guys. If you ever want to do something, um, let me know. And Gene got back to me and said, well, you know, take a drive down to Cherry Hill and we could talk. So I went down. Um, so it was the old Cherry Hill Flying Fish location, which was the now, sadly, old Forgotten Boardwalk Cherry Hill location. And I talked to Gene in his little tasting room at the time and I said, you know, here's what I do. What do you need? And he goes, well, honestly, I was trying to do all of this government stuff myself. Um, you know, we got run over by a bill a couple of years ago that had to do with franchise law. I missed the boat on that entirely. Now we're getting screwed. So I know if I want to make any changes to state laws, I need a lobbyist. So that's how I got involved. So we started talking. And I remember it was my first meeting with, at the time, it was the Garden State Craft Brewers Guild. It was at Triumph Brewing Company in Princeton. It was at the old location, um, which, by the way, that looks like the new one in, in Palmer Square in Princeton is going to open soon. Uh, it looks gorgeous. But so we're sitting around a table, and I think there's like 10 or 12 of us. And there's a couple different breweries that are there. Um, at the time, and we just start running through issues they want to take on. And it was this idea that at the time, they were only allowed to pour you, I think it was four three ounce samples to try and sell you two six packs. And they saw everything that was going on in the rest of the country, including Pennsylvania, and they went, What the hell? We want to have the same kind of rights that everybody else has. And by the way, this puts this in the context Flying Fish, I think, technically opened up the same year as Yards. Right. So they saw this business on the other side of the river that was just taken off. And they were like, OK, there's something wrong with New Jersey that's not allowing us to get there because we're making great beer and we're working with the same people. And um, this is this is nothing against Yards, but it's like Yards would have been successful either way. But during those years, everybody was successful. Like they mm -hmm. missed out on those years where like Big it time. didn't matter what sort of sort of beer you were making, Big time. what sort of brew you were, everybody if you were a craft brewery, you were growing explosively. So so Flying Fish, you know, their second brewery when they opened it up was I think to a certain extent kind of modeled along the lines of like kind of what Yards was doing down the street here, yeah. right? It was like that big production space that they could do all the stuff and they can get it out further. They can expand their, their footprint and things like that. The one thing that was holding them back was, and if you go to Yards today, they got a full restaurant. Yeah. They're selling other stuff. Yeah. You know, Flying Fierce at the time was like, it was a really big tasting room with only their own beers. That was it, right? So there definitely was a dynamic there. But so we're working on all this kind of stuff, and it's like, okay, we want to change the laws, and the main thing that we want to do is be able to sell a customer a pint of beer on the, on the premise. Like, just do that, because everybody else is doing that. Why shouldn't we? Also, too, at the time, you know, Iron Hill was looking to expand. Mm -hmm. They had this cap on the amount of brew pubs they could own in the state of New Jersey at two, and they were like, we have these vast expansion plans, we're going to do more. So those were kind of like the two big issues that we wanted to take on was, okay, allow you to drink a beer at a brewery and allow more brew pubs to open up New Jersey. And that was the basis to a law change that we got accomplished in 2012 that I got to say, I mean, right about that time, that's when folks like Kane, Carton, Kate May were just opening. So it was like, okay, you have this new law that now you have the ability to sell somebody a pint of beer you're making, you know, that cost you X amount for six bucks a pint or something like that, all of a sudden the money started coming in. And then everybody saw this opportunity saying, okay, I'm sitting on the sidelines here, I'm either working for one of these new breweries or I'm home brewing and I make good beer and everybody's telling me making them good beer, I'm gonna do this. And that's what kind of launched everybody. So, so you went from like 25 breweries to like 140 or something? We're at 140 right now. I mean, yeah. there, was, there was a thing done a couple years ago that said that, um, I think it was us in Kentucky, which was kind of weird about Kentucky, but we had the biggest percentage of growth of any state in breweries in the entire country. And it was like, I mean, I think about it now. I mean, we're close to a 500% increase since the time I started working with this industry, right? Yeah. So there obviously was a demand, not only from the consumer, but also folks that were looking to open up a brewery that they just couldn't figure out how to make the numbers work. Mm -hmm. When they were able to start selling beer on premise, that's what started making the numbers work. 
But what happened, though, was that there was this reaction from folks that had liquor licenses that said, wait a minute, they didn't pay their freight. We have to stop them. And that's why for the first time in 17... Wait, what do you mean they didn't pay their freight? They didn't pay for a liquor license. That oh, breweries, gotcha, that breweries gotcha. did not pay for the million-dollar yeah. liquor license that you know some of these restaurants and things had said that they had paid to be able to sell alcohol. Now, you know, you walk into a brewery, brewery equipment's not cheap. Um, it depreciates every day. So it's not like you're getting your money back for that old equipment. Liquor licenses have been shown in the state of New Jersey to increece in value. I mean, the liquor yeah, license. Why the game passed from generation to generation? I mean, I mean, a liquor license that you bought, you know, for a hundred thousand dollars, could be a million dollars today. I mean, it, the, no investment works like that. I mean, sometimes the liquor license itself is more valuable than the restaurant itself. I mean, that's that's the way this works. So, the growth of the industry from that law change then caused the reaction that pushed back on us, that put us in a place that we had to fight restrictions that those industries had talked regulators into putting that they had couched as, we're just trying to create fairness amongst everybody. And what was this? This was the restaurant? Uh, yeah, it was restaurants, it was bars, okay. it was wholesalers. I mean, and this is, it's, it's interesting too. So, and this was 2017? And, and yeah, Can you explain 17. the wholesaler portion? Because I don't understand that. Because yeah. wholesalers benefit from craft brewers as well. Like, why were wholesalers so against Not them? when you can self-distribute your own beer. Okay. And so, now, yeah. So in New Jersey, and that's the part of the thing. So every wholesalers typically want every single drop of liquid poured and sold in the state to be theirs. When you have a new business model that's opening up, that is increasingly getting out into the marketplace, not only in distribution, but selling to consumers on premise. Are the are the self distribution laws similar to Pennsylvania? So if a craft brewery in the state of New Jersey wants to buy a van, put their beer on it, and drive around the state and sell their beer, they can do that. Okay. Um, some folks, because you know it's too heavy of a lift or they want to expand their territory to business they can't get into, work with the distributor. And they some of them do. Um, but that ability of this new business model to sell beer that wasn't theirs was a challenge to them. So they, to a certain extent early on, we're talking like 16, 17, partnered with a licensed beverage association that were exclusively liquor license holders, New Jersey Restaurant Association, which also represented a lot of license holders, to basically talk regulators to say, you need to put something on the books that restricts their ability to do what we do and have the type of environments that are bringing what they had perceived as their customers to our brewery instead of going to them. So that's this is where this all came from. I from reading lots of books and kind of being plugged in the brewing industry for so long, I've heard that, you know, the way you really make money with alcohol is not opening up a brewery, it's not opening up a bar or restaurant, it's being a wholesaler. Oh, it's, it's, it's like huge. It's the money is in the middle. It's huge. It's huge. <laughs> and by the way, in New Jersey, and I was, I was telling this before about how I got into it, the laws are so one-sided mm -hmm. in terms of the wholesaler that you almost can't break the contract. It's like signing your life away in blood. It's, it's really it's tough. It's the same thing in Pennsylvania, and it's like, you know, there's reasons for that, but it's like, it is like it's... Uh, it's, it's just part of the industry. It's kind well, that's of crazy. the thing. Some of the laws, some of the laws were done on that industry was when a time where there was like you know, ten breweries. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's business yeah, was contingent you, on. And, and if you lose, and like the yeah. like, but Anheuser Busch would like go to these places and like they would like basically threaten wholesalers yeah. and be like, if you don't do this exactly how we're doing it, like we're just not going to sell you and the, beer. And, and, and like you know, that's you know, a company that might have two hundred employees basically is like. Relies on Anheuser Busch, and and by the way, the the way the laws were changed in New Jersey on that wholesale issue was when there were some mergers that were happening in the industry that people were losing like fifty percent of their business. Yeah. So I get it, but the fact is though is that some of these breweries, their entire year, are making about two years worth, two hours worth of beer, at the Newark plant of Budweiser. Right. So it's like, how can that same law impact this little Main Street brewery? as it does to a, a brewery that's making 2 million barrels of beer a year. I mean, that's what we're up against, right? Yeah, and I think when craft beer was like so explosive, like there was this fear that like craft beer would then take over and Anheuser-Busch was like, 
paying like a billion dollars for Ballast Point and all this stuff. Yep. And like it turns, that's not the case. Like it's no. a premium product. Like it is not going to overtake Budweiser. Like, and if it anything, is, it's so more hyper local now. It is. And it's, it's if it's like, not on your block, it's not local enough. Exactly. And it's it's capped at, you know, like probably 20% is like the maximum that craft beer is going to be. But it's a premium product. Like mm-hmm. they don't need to be scared of it. It's just, it's part of the culture now. And it's like, yep. just what it is. Yep. So, I mean, those types of things had caused you know, the restrictions that we ended up defeating was just this pressure from, you know, the traditional alcohol industry saying like, you know, there's these new kids that are out there that are trying to do something that haven't invested in the same license structure that we have. We have to protect that at all costs. So if that means putting restrictions on them that distinctly put, you know, limit their ability to do some of the things that we're able to do, that's what we're for. And they were able to talk uh, regulators into doing that. The problem was that those conversations, honestly, were kind of done in the dark, kind of behind the scenes that nobody was really paying attention to. When some of those decisions kind of came out into the public and when elected officials started seeing that and when the public started seeing that, that's when the reaction against it happened. Um, you know, when, you know, if it's if it's in a small little room and there's a couple of people making the decisions, people can get away with stuff like yeah. that. But when it comes out in the, like, the light of the day uh, and... From my experience in working with alcohol, up until probably the last 20 years, that's where most of the decisions were made. It was made by a couple folks in a room that had vested interest in maintaining the system. I think there's a new day in that, and that's what's kind of leading to all these different changes. And by the way, it's not only in beer. It's in distilling. It's in wine. It's with all the projects. Now it's going into, like, cannabis beverages. Now it's going into all these different types of things. So it's it's there's there's folks there now, and there's... There's always a counter reaction to that kind of somebody taking over somebody's turf. And honestly, that's probably never going to go away. Are you seeing that? Are you involved at all with the wine or liquor industry? So it's funny. The the bill that just got signed uh, by Governor Murphy uh, a couple months ago actually impacted not only craft beer, but also craft spirits. Um, also cider and mead. Yeah. So while the restrictions were first placed on our industry, those other industries always thought were next because the way their laws were written, which came after the reforms that we initially did, were written very similarly based on our experience. So it was probably only a matter of time. So when they were trying to change our laws, they got lumped in with us. Um, So we actually worked with some of those folks um, to basically kind of promote the idea that the laws needed to be changed and stuff. So they got the benefit of our change. I mean, they never had the restrictions so they really had nothing to worry about. But, you know, now they have this new day where it's like, wow, we can do whatever events we want. And it says we can do this and that. And it's like, you know, we, we had to be like in the penalty box for like a, almost a decade <laughs> where they got a free they got a free ride to a certain extent. But, you know, we, we work with them. The wineries are a totally different thing. I mean, what we were always told about the wineries was that, you know, they've been around for like 30, 40 years in New Jersey. Um, and nobody perceived them as a threat at the time. So it's they got, part of the culture, I guess. They got know? to do whatever they wanted, yeah. right? They have everything. Um, are they acting differently now? Are they acting more <laughs> aligned with like breweries with events and like the I mean, festivals and whatnot? They have their own. I mean, they have their own unique issues in New Jersey that I'm sure they're up against. Um, the interesting thing that happened uh, towards the end of last year was that some of the wineries wanted to start making beer. Really? Yes, they did. Um, there was a couple pieces of legislation that were introduced that folks thought the idea of like, okay, if they were only able to make a certain amount of beer, they could do beer and wine and all these types of things. And it's like, okay, um, so what is that going to do with the breweries that put like their life savings? I mean, it's funny to say this, but it's like we're now on the other side kind of like thinking like, is this a good idea for our industry? We now never wanted to be the, that like protectionist type people. of folks. Yeah. <laughs> so now it's like we're thinking about those types of things. But I, you know, I don't think there's a big push for something like that. Um, you know, I do see a day, though, that like, you know, we were talking about before. Pennsylvania allows you if you're one of like a craft beverage manufacturer to sell all different types of Pennsylvania made alcohol. Mm-hmm. We'd like to do that in New Jersey too. Like why not promote the local stuff, right? There's been a lot of projects over the years amongst these different manufacturers, whether it be like, you know, the local distillery supplies us with a couple barrels and you put your beer in it and you age it in it. Or, you know, you work with your local winery at like a joint festival or something like that. Uh, these folks want to partner with one another. Um, and the customers really like the really hyper local angle. So, I mean, that's one of those things though. Like I keep talking about license value. 
that's going to be perceived as a threat. Um, we've already heard it to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to claim that we're operating like bars because we have all different types of alcohol. Are, you, in are it. they? I mean, I don't know if you want to get into this, but are are they seeing it? Like, are the are the values of liquor licenses dropping because these laws are passing? Uh, I have not found that. Okay. I have not seen anything official from anybody that yeah. says that. Um, I mean, and that's the other part of this too. So when they did our revisions back in December, there was this huge push for our governor for overall alcohol reform, right? He had thought that small restaurants were being hurt by the inability to sell alcohol yeah, and that the whole license value thing was ridiculous and that everybody should be able to get a license regardless of the population in your town or anything like that. So he had pursued for like about two years this whole reform plan, which... And what, what does that include? Just issuing more liquor licenses out? So in New Jersey, there is a population cap on the amount of licenses a, a town can have an issue. So it's one license for every 3,000 people that live in your town. Some of those licenses are grandfathered back from the old days, back in Prohibition. So you get got towns like in New Jersey, like Jersey City, that have way more licenses. But those licenses can only be used in that town. So even if there's a need in a neighboring town, you couldn't send that license to a neighboring town. So what the governor wanted to do was, over like a five or six year period, dial back that population cap, creating more licenses, and then after a certain amount of time, there's no cap. If a town wanted to create a license, they could. Well, as you could expect, based on our experience in the brewery stuff, the restaurants flipped out, right? They got to the legislature real quick, and I think within like a couple months of the governor announcing his plans to do that, we knew it wasn't going to happen. And we knew our changes that we needed were probably going to be lumped in with the governor's proposal. We knew it wasn't going to pass with the governor's proposal, so we went our own route. We got our bill to the governor's desk prior to him being able to make any progress on his stuff. The reason why we did the Brew Jersey beer, we did the sign the bill, uh, sign the bill fill beer, all those type of things was because we were trying to get him to sign our standalone legislation because we knew the rest of his stuff was never going to pass. He let our bill sit on his desk the first time for six months, okay, which was— And wasn't it unanimous— Unanimously oh, agreed everybody, upon. Everybody, everybody, everybody. Yeah. It was. And, and by the way, we took advantage of an election year, so everybody was like, "Why wouldn't I support a brewery in an election year?" But we got a beer bill to his desk, and he sat on it for six months. And I think, by the way, I think maybe like two or three breweries closed in that six months, which was which you know pissed everybody. I've been off. waiting for my brewery license to pass, and it's been two weeks, and I am sweating. I couldn't imagine <laughs> waiting six but, months. But like, so there's so we're sitting there, and everybody's asking me, "Is he going to sign it? He's going to sign." I'm like, "He's going to make us wait till November, guaranteed." So it was, I think, the literally the last hour of the last day he could have waited, and he issued something saying, basically, "I'm not signing it. I want." overall alcohol reform like all the stuff i wanted to do and i remember talking to some of the folks down in trenton including our sponsors and they were like i don't know if we're going to get this done i said you guys might have to wait another two years i went there's no way we could possibly wait two years so i think finally after some kind of behind the scenes conversations with the governor's office and the legislature they finally kind of caved but they also figured out a way to kind of paint a picture of everybody could say they claim victory and we still get what we wanted. So they ended up redoing our bill that took about two and a half years to get done in about three weeks. And we were just along for the ride, and we just rode that, and finally got done, and then he signed it the second week of January. I I remember when all this was going down, seeing just the roller coaster ride that it was, being like, it's on the desk, Mm -hmm. it just got declined. And then all of a sudden, like from my point of view, it's like, oh, wow, what does that mean? I guess it's done. Mm -hmm. I think it's about like a month later. It was like, no, it's back in the it's back in the the picture. So uh, we went through a similar roller coaster in that month that was basically the day that he conditionally vetoed it in New Jersey um, to say what he really wanted. We were basically like we just did all that for nothing. Um, and what are we going to do, and how are we honestly going to explain this to all these businesses? Um, but, you know, you know, calmer heads kind of prevailed. Um, you know, they saw the benefit of actually doing this and taking this off the table, and they ended up doing it. And as much as, you know, we had always criticized the governor for 
you know, allowing those restrictions to go in place at the beginning anyway, right? Like he could have, with a stroke of a pen, just made this all go away. Yeah. Like he could have. We still say that. The famous quote that he had had, and it was on a local TV show, was that somebody asked him, like, why can't you make these re- these restrictions go away? He says, I can't. You're the governor. You could do whatever you want. I mean, he's the strongest governor in the state. I mean, the entire country. But he claimed he couldn't do it. So, but at the end of the day, he ultimately signed the bill. Got to give him credit um, for doing that. Um, you know, he recognized the need to, to do this, but... You know, it was a situation, honestly, that probably should have never happened to begin with. Mm-hmm. I mean, they they could have done something that, you know, I think calmer heads could have prevailed early on, and they could have put something in place that said, okay, we're going to create a system that does show the distinction between the liquor license holder and the bar, and, and the bar and the, and the brewery, but they just did it. And they did it in a way that caused the reaction it did. We're all sitting in... I think it was, you know, 2021, I guess, at that point, in June. And all of a sudden, people start getting stuff on their license that says, you can't do this, you can't do that. And everybody went, what the hell is this? And it caused this massive reaction that people started talking to the press. People started going on TV. People started calling people. And it blew up in the administration's face. I think there was just a better, like, line of communication. It could have been all avoided, and it is. But they decided to do what they were going to do, so... You know, there was a counter reaction to that, and that's what we did. Politics. Oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> I mean, I'm used to it now, but it still not, doesn't surprise me. But um, if everybody would just kind of like take a breath, pause a second, think about the ramifications of it, um, you know, it would probably work out better, but people just overreacted. Yeah. So, what's, what's kind of the next steps for New Jersey? So, I mean, it's. You know, coming off of three years of working exclusively on one issue the entire time, there's a lot of pent up demands in terms of like what's next. Yeah. Um, it's funny we were actually in the last couple of weeks talking about like what's next, like what's the next generation of, you know, what this industry in New Jersey wants to change. I mean, there's a lot of cool things that are happening in other states. I mean, Pennsylvania, New York included, that we would like to mimic um, in terms of some of the privileges and things. I mean, some of it has to go into you know, do we want to change laws again to give breweries more ability to sell more product and to sell different things, mm-hmm. right? There's also like, okay, do we want to concentrate on ideas of just how to promote the industry, like how to take advantage of state resources to just get the word out more about breweries and things like that? Um, I mentioned before, you know, we have a, you know, pot is legal in New Jersey, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, right. literally, yeah. Pot is legal in New Jersey. Other states have looked um, at, you know, breweries, like, namely places like Minnesota, right? They make hemp-based beverages, THC beverages, things like that. Does New, do we want to go someplace there and do that? Do we want to allow a brewery to make other types of alcohol? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know. I mean, wineries can do it. Why can't brewery make wine? I mean, there's all those different types of things that it's like, okay, I would say there's probably like a list of like a dozen to 15 different things that we're like chomping on right now. Some of which is like, okay. Sell food. I mean, I mean, you guys said the food trucks, but like, you know, selling food on premise, like that's. So some of the things, I mean, there might be a little bit of fatigue on some of those issues, honestly. Like the legislature just went. They're just tired of hearing about it. They went through like World War Three on that. Um, it's like, how much do we want to keep banging on that issue? Because it's like, yeah, it's like, it's like enough enough, like go a different way and try to figure something out. Maybe not as something as like huge as that, that's going to cause people to have to like pick like their favorite kid, which I mean, some of these debates come down to, it's like, we don't want to have to put them in position. Maybe it's a bunch of smaller stuff, but it's still meaningful to us, but doesn't necessarily cross the line of like being perceived as hurting other people. Um, but there's some pretty, I mean, and honestly too, I mean, there are some really old fashioned rules in place in New Jersey about like stupid paperwork things and things like that. Like not the sexiest stuff that's out there, but but, it matters. Oh, it matters. Every, every single little thing. I mean, if it adds up, like those smaller things adds up, it means as much as getting like some huge ability to sell something to a customer on premise. Like, you know, we have a system here that like every single beer that you make, you got to pay $23 to the state basically to brand register it. 
I was looking today at something in Pennsylvania. Like they allow you to like put a bunch of, I think it's like 20 beers at a time for like $125, right? New Jersey, it's 23 bucks a pop. Just the math in simple, like for a little brewery like that, think how much money you could save on something like that. So it's, it's things like that. Um, also too, I mean, we're an affiliate of the National Trade Association. As much as Congress doesn't do anything, um, there's always things happening kind of behind the scenes that we're, we're paying attention to. The latest thing was, and it's it could be a big impactful thing, the feds want to change the way um, labels work and put nutritional information on the label, right? I mean, that's B- anheuser Bush stepping in and knowing that little guys can't compete, so they're, like, doing it. And they tried to make the push yeah. for a couple of years when they were automatically doing it, knowing that little guys just can't do it. And that's the kind of the reaction of it. Of the BA is doing a good job, I think, of trying to get the the issues out there saying, like, okay, certainly things like allergy, like contents, like if lactose is in the beer, maybe you should tell somebody. Yeah. Like things like that. Um, maybe accurately say how much alcohol is in the beer, right? But if you start to start worry about carbohydrates, calorie counts, things like that, you know, the amount of work it would take for a small batch beer to be able to get that much information on a label, to go to a lab and do that stuff, that could honestly just keep that beer from being made all together. It would together. cost as much as the money that no. some of these places that just have like a homebrew set up yep. would make just selling the beer. So it's it's basically, it's like also feeding into that situation, which if it doesn't get resolved in the right way, you know, is honestly could make all the different things that we've tried to achieve here at the state level that wouldn't, wouldn't matter because there's going to be a, there would be a bunch of small businesses that literally couldn't comply or they would say, okay, I'm making four beers. That's all I'm doing. I'll do this work once and that's all I'm going to sell. And those beers that I make every couple of weeks, I'm just not going to make anymore. So I think the BA realizes that they're trying to sell that to everybody saying like, okay, any beer that's only made like for sale in your own state, you shouldn't have to do this for. There should be tolerances to all and these information. People that don't understand the industry, they might look at that and be like, "Oh, this is a nice concession," but they don't understand. No. Like, that's not how the brewing industry works. No. That's not why people are attracted to it. Like yeah. they, they want that selection. It's part of the culture of craft beer. Yeah, and there is certainly an element of the macro guys um, who have the wherewithal and the finances to be able to pull some of that stuff off. Yeah. Who are certainly not making you know, all those different products as frequently Mm -hmm. um, of trying to kind of capture back some of the market share by putting some of these things in place. Everybody gets that. But I think, um, you know, there's been a big pushback. I think I saw the other day, there was thousands of comments submitted on this to say like, you can't do this. Or if you're going to do it, you got to pay attention to the way this industry works. That's going to be the next thing in the next couple months that I think we're going to be looking at to say, okay, how is this going to impact the beers that everybody loves and if you're going to be able to continue to get them the same way because the to be able to sell and this is to sell that nine percent beer with you know this barrel age that's got all these ingredients in it and lactose and things like that it might not be economically feasible if there's labeling requirements to do that like that's the serious. also who's gonna buy that when it says 800 calories well that's the thing no too label. i mean i mean i think I, need to be reminded. I think we all know beer has calories i mean there's a thing like you know it's it's like one of these things is like you're you're showing us something that we already know like you don't have to throw it in our face yeah. over it but no one's drinking beer i mean some people might you you have to be an idiot to drink beer for its nutritional value you're drinking it to get drunk no. It's like, as much as you don't want to say that, it's like, that's not how you need to be promoting yourself as a brewery. Like, there's alcohol, and it's like, it is not a nutritional... The saving grace to all of this might be is that it's just not beer, it's all alcohol. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see these potentially impact wine, you're going to see this impact spirits. So there's going to be strong a strong push on the the level. So it's everybody's going to basically be like, yeah... This, this is, is <laughs> this is not going to happen, um, or if it does happen, it's going to be a lot dialed back to what's been thrown out there so far. Cool. Yeah. Real quick, I want to just like quickly talk about the beers you brought. Um, I know we're getting close on time. Yeah, no, no we, we, can, we can do this. Um, so I guess what do you? I like the look of that label a lot. So the Mr. first beer. So I kind of I brought name. some beers that were kind of connected to one another. So um, a couple years ago, to raise funds for the guild and to also kind of promote some of the work that yeah. we were doing on, we started the Brew Jersey uh, project. So we've had a couple beers come out, including the Sign the Bill Phil. 
The latest beer is the Brew Jersey Clean Slate. Um, Clean Slate being that our associations have merged once again in New Jersey. So we're once again one group. It's the Brewers Guild in New Jersey. Um, so the NJBA merged with us. Um, so now we're one group. Um, it's a Pilsner. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, pretty easy recipe for everybody to take on and collaborate on. But the initial idea behind the whole Brew Jersey project came from Icarus Brewing Company in Lakewood, New Jersey. Um, they're actually opening up a new brewery in Brick, hopefully be open in June. Um, they had started this whole idea of doing this collaboration beer, which included the idea of getting out to the consumer the idea of supporting our legislation. We had actually, the first beer we did, we put QR codes on every single can. So somebody go to a website to weigh in with their legislator about the bill. I, I watched some previous interview you did, and like you guys, you were able to map when these beers came out and when... Mm -hmm these neighborhoods like lit up and then the legislators were actually like changing their minds, which is crazy. You know, this is not the first time the craft brewing industry has made like a collaborative beer. Like they mm -hmm. do it all the time, like the Maui fires, mm -hmm. all these other things, the brave noise, like all these yep. things for different causes. And you know, me being kind of in the industry, I see, I'm like, all right, how much is this actually making? Like what difference does it actually make? Like, yes, you're donating money, but like, we don't see any changes from it. Like you were able to actually map yep. that there was actually, you know, an effect from this beer. And it wasn't even, and it wasn't even about the money necessarily. Right. So while it did kind of contribute to the campaign and help us do some, some communications efforts in terms of it, it was more or less kind of getting the word out about how to weigh in with your local legislator in a, like a really cool way. Also, too, just the, the press it got early on in terms of, like, you mean there's a beer that has to do with a piece of legislation? Like, everybody, that was the hook. Yeah. And everybody took it up, particularly with the Sign the Bill Phil beer, which, um, you know, I had a local reporter ask me for a four-pack to force the governor to drink on local radio, which was an interesting story in and of itself, but it was, it was cool the way it turned out. But I got to give a lot of credit to the, the folks at Icarus. It was their kind of brainchild to do it. And they came up with the recipes. They started with the first batches of it. We're now on the third one. This Pilsner idea was theirs. There's more in New Jersey hitting the market. I know we're drinking one from Twin Elephant that's up in Chatham up in Morris County. Um, but I know in the last couple of weeks, there's some other seven tribesmen up in Wayne, New Jersey, New Jersey. Carton at the shore in Atlantic Highlands is coming up with their own version this week. Um, so it's a really cool concept, and I hope to keep doing it going forward to kind of assist the gill and to get our, our word about some of the issues that we're going to be bringing up. Um, the other beer, um, directly from Icarus, um, is more along the lines of, you know, what they're, what they're really good at. Um, it's a hazy, I think, a New England-style Indian pale ale. Um, great. Yeah, it's, I think, 6.5, really drinkable. They have um, a yacht juice. That's kind of their w, double IPA, a little higher octane there. Um, but this is kind of like, a, you know, just a good, <laughs> solid beer. I just wanted to put that out there because, I mean, folks like Icarus who, you know, they're not the newest brewery on the block, but they're fairly new. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that we did here in New Jersey, I think, were the most meaningful to them. I mean, they were literally breaking ground on a new brewery that they're putting millions of dollars in when all these restrictions were being put into place. And that if this didn't actually work and we got this bill done, I don't know what would have happened. I mean, they were building out tasting rooms, event spaces, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, here you are in this limbo. And, you know, this is this is how laws and being put into place or not being changed could really impact a business. So I'm glad it worked out. It gives folks like Twin Elephant, folks like Icarus, a really good future ahead of them. And, you know, more great beers like we're drinking tonight hopefully come out of them for years to come. Cool. Um, well, thank you for coming on. I mean, this is, it was interesting because like, you know, you are a lobbyist, like you are an mm -hmm. expert in kind of how the you know executive branch works and like how laws are made. And like, you know, this is something just being in Pennsylvania, like we, it has been a great production state. So like, we really haven't had to deal with these laws. Yep. So like to hear the issues that New Jersey has, it's like kind of eye opening. Like, wow. Like, and by the way, the the guys in New Jersey are super jealous of Pennsylvania. I mean, it, it's if they could have the experience to a certain extent, like the guys in Pennsylvania do, um, they would sign up for that in a heartbeat. I'm sure. But yeah, you're making that happen. Hopefully, we continue it going, and the and the trajectory goes up. But um, you know, it's it, it, we're 
definitely in a better place than we were even last year. So it's it's good to, it's good to be part of an industry that um, is on a positive track. Cool. So what can you know people do? They go to Brewers of New Jersey. Like what what can they? So do it's funny. You? We are now in the latest and greatest thing, and it's local to here. Um, the Battleship Festival is coming up soon. Okay. Yeah. Right. So um, June twenty second, we're gonna be doing the festival. Um, hopefully, the Battleship's back in doc by then <laughs> um you know we're kind of counting the days we, we've been told it's going to be there in time um for june um if not we'll, we'll still do it it might be on land it might not be on water um but that's i mean the way to support our guild and support the industry is to buy tickets to events like that because what that really does it kind of underrates what we do as an association and trying to advocate for the laws and for the consumers of the state of new jersey so be on the lookout for that. I know there's some social media at that that's being pressed by the Guild. Also, we're working on another festival um, further up in central Jersey um, on July 6th, um, actually in my hometown of Branchburg, New Jersey, um, that we're doing another festival as well. And it's also to support the efforts of the Guild, um, just to expose consumers to another group of breweries to try to get some of our word out there. Um, that festival... Um, was supposed to take place last year. It didn't get off the ground, but we're going to do it this year. It saved the ales. Um, so we will um, get some more stuff out on social media on that. Look at the Brewers Guild of New Jersey. Uh, we have a website, Facebook, Instagram, all that cool stuff. So look at it and uh, learn the latest about what we're doing. Nice. Go check out your next New Jersey brewery. Plan your trip out there. See what's happening. And uh, you can follow us at the Brewdat Podcast or at Brewdat. And uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Thanks, guys.